How many of you are ready for a little word today? Father, we just uh, lock in this morning to your presence and your life. We just lock into your love this morning, Father God. And we uh, allow your love to overwhelm us and overtake us, even during this message this morning. Father, I thank you that all of us have ears to hear, eyes to see. We have the ability to comprehend and, Father, move forward in our lives with the things that you have deposited in us long, long ago. And I thank you for that. My hope is, Father, my expectation in the days ahead is that the things that we know will work better for us than they ever have. And I thank you for that. I'm not releasing my hope. I'm not giving in to negativity or doubt that is going on around me. Father, I can only lock in to who you said that I am and who you said that we are and who that you said you are living in us, and I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, that my lips, my mind, my emotions are anointed this morning to say those things that I need to say to those that are listening, and I thank you for that in Jesus' name, and everybody that agreed said, give somebody a high five and say, I'm locked in. Well, this is uh, part five of building our lives on love. That's our theme. I always have a theme every year of some kind. And it's not that that theme goes away after we get from this year to next year. You know, it's just a theme. It's something for us to focus in on and to, to uh, teach from. And, you know, I, I feel like that Actually, this theme is an every year theme, like I was just saying, but our focus is going to be specifically this year building and constructing a healthy view of God, a healthy view of ourselves, and a healthy view of other people. We are, we are in the construction zone. Uh, not only is there demolition and destruct, deconstruction going on, but there's construction going on. And any time that there's construction going on, uh, sometimes things get messy. Look at somebody and say, things could get messy. And, but, but the truth is, my hope, my earnest expectation, that's what that word hope means, my earnest expectation is that in the days ahead, we will begin to uh, have functionality. We will be able to function within the truth that we say we know and that we're walking in, that it will be functional, that it will be working, it will be effectual in our, in our lives. And, you know, what living in the awareness of love, as I, as I was thinking about this just even a little bit this morning during worship, you know, Jesus was living in the awareness of love. He was living in, I think he grew in that as a human being. He grew in that for 30 years, and then he began his ministry, and that ministry lasted for three and a half years in a physical body, but that ministry has always, <laughs> that ministry has always been going on, like Robin said a while ago. That ministry uh, has always been going on. So I see Jesus living in the awareness of love, and out of that awareness of love, there was a compassion that came forth in his life to everyone around, around him. And I believe he displayed that, that compassion, that passion towards those that were good and towards those that were bad, towards those that thought they were good and they were really bad, and towards those who were really good but thought they were bad. Right. Yeah. Think about it. Jesus was good to everybody. He was compassionate to everybody. Did he have a plan? Did he have a, uh, a mode of uh, operation that he was flowing from? Yes, he did. It was all from love, and it was all to get people to come in to the awareness of that love. And that's why, 
That's why Jesus came in a physical body was to display and show the love of the Father that the world had never seen. And like Robin said, you know, sometimes we, you know, I mean, the thing, guys, that changed my life 10 or 11 years ago was finding out that the Bible wasn't written to me. It was written for me. That's, that, that was a significant thing. I was already preaching some of this stuff before I came into that knowledge. All it did was was caused me to go deeper down into the rabbit hole than I had ever gone. And I'm still going down that rabbit hole. There's, there's no end to the goodness of God. There's no end to living in the awareness of God. Uh, my, my bottom line is, I just want this to actually work for us. How about that? And I think it can, but I think we're going to have to make some adjustments. Okay? I think there's still some adjustments to be made in order for us to walk this out in the reality of our lives, okay? So let me, let me just say this, if Jesus did it, you can. Amen. He was a man with God living on the inside of him, you're a man or a woman with God living on the inside of you. That's what Jesus came to display. If Jesus did what he did... Uh, from any other means, then you and I couldn't operate the same way he did. But he laid down everything that he was to operate as a man, understanding that the Father was living in him and that he was one with the Father. So let me, let me start off this morning with a couple of Old Testament passages. You know, we've been looking at compassion scriptures. You know, Jesus would preach the kingdom of God and then he would display the kingdom of God. He would display life with the Father. He would display that and, and he would display that compassion. Compassion was rolling out of him constantly. The first scripture I want to look at is Psalms 86.15. And the word compassion in the Old Testament and the word compassion in the New Testament are very similar. Uh, of course, the one in the old is Hebrew, the one in the new is Greek, but they're very similar, and I'll read that definition here again. But you, O oh Lord, are full of compassion. If he's full of compassion, then there's nothing else in there. I'll just let that one just kind of sink down in there. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion. This is in the Old Testament. And gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in mercy and truth. Numbers of scriptures in the Old Testament even says that His mercy endures for just a little while. Forever. His mercy never ceases. It never stops. It's new every day, every morning. Then in, in Isaiah 49, 13 through 16, I love this. It says, Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth, and break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted His people and will have mercy on His afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. That was their thought process, but that's been our thought process as well, even under a new covenant. Verse 15, the response is, can a woman forget her nursing child? <laughs> and we could talk about a number of things there. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Now think about this, Now, and I'm, I don't want to go into detail in this, but whenever my wife had children, uh, those children needed to be very, not too far away from her whenever she was nursing them. Do you, at least the women understand what I'm saying. So, so that's what this is implying here, is that can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? You know what? It wouldn't matter anything that I did, my mother would always love me. And maybe that's why I didn't do some of the things that I could have done, because I didn't want to disappoint her. Come on now. And that's okay. And it kept, my, it kept a lot of my brain cells alive. 
Listen to this. Surely they may forget. Your mother may forget. This woman that's nursing her, she may forget, yet I will not forget you. This is in the Old Testament. I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand, and your walls are continually before me. There's never been one moment of any day that He has not loved you. But there have been many days that you and I have not experienced that love. We have not been aware of that love. A lot of that is because of the things that we've been taught, the awareness of doctrines that moved us away from this inclusive love and this place that the Father would never forget you. In the middle of your worst moment, He has never forgotten you. He knows where you are, but it isn't just up to Him whether or not you live a good life. It's you living in the awareness of that love. Now hang with me. If I don't get done this morning, I'll get done next week, okay? All right. That's so powerful. Everybody say, I'm tattooed in the palm of His hand. Whoa, man, I love that. Your walls are continually before me. So let me, let me read the definition of the word uh, compassion again. It's the Greek word, splank nidzomai. It means to be moved as to one's bowels, thought to be the seed of love and pity, hence to be moved with one's compassion, and that flows out of one's character, what the, the, the reality of who one is. To yearn from deep within, to be moved with unconditional uh, love, to a deep yearning to act, to act on the behalf of someone else. It, it shakes us into action. Compassion evokes an emotional and a physical response to someone that is suffering. Compassion is the action of agape, unconditional love, steadfast love, unfailing love. Compassion is the byproduct of building your life on this love, on this agape, the very character and, and essence of God, the very character and the essence of who you are. The thing that holds the entire universe together is this love. It, the, the, this field of whatever we're in in this physical realm at this moment, everything is held together by the force, by the character of God's love. His very essence, this is what has created everything around us. Can I hear an amen this morning? I want you to turn and look. I know they're going to put it up on the screen. But if you've got your own Bible, just turn over there or flip over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm going to read uh, verse... I reread it last week, but I just want to read the definition of love again out of the Mirror Bible while you're looking at whatever translation you have. It says in verse 4, Love is large in being passionate about life and relentlessly patient in bearing the offenses and injuries of others with kindness. Back in our series a few years ago that we did on Job, we looked at the words hupomino and hupomene, those, those, those Greek words hupomino and hupomene. There's a lot of things that we bear up underneath. There's a lot of people that are bearing up underneath the situations that we're in in life at this moment. But that other word, hupomene, hupomino, hupomino, hupomene, what the, the second one of those words mean that not only do you bear up underneath something, but you bear up underneath something with kindness. I didn't hear what you, said. you bear up underneath something with kindness. <laughs> this is pretty good. I, I couldn't make that happen if I wanted to. Oh, man. See, there's a, we, can, we can bear up underneath things, but are we bearing up under it with, with being aware of the living in the awareness of that love? Be, living in the awareness of that love will cause you to be kind while you're bearing up underneath something, something that is terrible. 
And that's what's going to change the field. That's what's going to change everything around us. Whenever It's not that we need something else. We need to have removed from us the existence of those things that have come in and attached itself to the supreme essence and character of it, what, what has held the universe together. That was really good. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want, to, I want us to go to Ephesians 3. And, and again, if I don't get done this morning, uh, go Chiefs. We will, <laughs> we will make it through this. And, and, and this is so powerful. And I think the Spirit of God is breathing on me a little bit differently than He even did two weeks ago. Look at somebody and say, oh, no. <laughs> For this reason, Paul has said some magnificent things in the first couple of chapters of the book of Ephesians about our inclusion, about his love, and all of those things. And he comes to this place of, in, in chapter 3 and verse 14, and he's already prayed one prayer that we, would, that we would comprehend and understand everything that was in the saints, that the eyes of our understanding would be opened that we would have the ability to comprehend some things. And, and, and then he says that this mystery about Christ in you, that he was preaching to the Gentiles, he had just made some statements before he comes here to verse 14, and he said, it's about me declaring what has always been true of you. This is the mystery that has been hid. This is the mystery, Christ in you. You could never be separated from this mystery, even though a Jewish nation tried to separate you from this, you've never been separated. And then in verse 14 it says this, let me read through it, and then today and next week we'll start to break this down. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Everybody say, that's everybody. That He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God. Now to Him, who is that Him? Hmm. Who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Now let me jump back to finish reading uh, what I started reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the definition of love. These two things, what I just read out of here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and the dimensions of the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, these two are attached. And I said last week, you could begin to attach things all over. Paul told Timothy uh, about the law. He said, even the end of the commandment that was given in the Old Testament, even the end of the con con commandment, I think in your King James it says charity, but it's agape. The end of the commandment is about the love. Everything is about the love of God. And I will tell you, we make it a lot of times about everything other than that. Back to the definition. And I got my running shoes on this morning. So, and I did my stretching so I could take off. And Raymond, you just go ahead and read my notes if I take off, okay? Uh, love is completely content and strives for nothing. Love has no desire to make others feel inferior and has no need to sing its own praises. Love is predictable and does not behave out of character. Wow, have we said that God behaves out of character from, from the time of Adam up until present time. A lot of us have believed things about God. We've written things about God. We've said things about God that is totally out of the character that Jesus represented whenever He was showing us the Father. 
Love is not ambitious. Man, I've been talking to Robin about that all week. I'm going to let that one go. Love is not spiteful and gets no mileage out of another's mistake. It bears no record of wrongs. God has never kept a record of wrongs like we've been told. God has never kept a record of wrongs. That was what we thought. Love sees no joy in injustice. Love de- love's delight is in everything that truth celebrates. Love is a fortress, I love this, where everyone feels protected rather than exposed. Love's persuasion is persistent. Love believes. Love never loses hope and always remains constant in the middle of contradiction. The contradiction gives love its altitude. And that's what it goes on to say here in verse 8. Love never loses its altitude. Prophecies will cease. Tongues will pause. The quest for knowledge will be inappropriate when perfection is grasped. Oh, man. What we perceived in prophetic glimpses is now concluded in completeness. Look at somebody and say, I am complete in this love. I always have been complete. Once my knowledge comes into the experience of grasping the heights, the depths, the breadths, the lengths of His love, then anything I think or ask will manifest in my moment. So you are one with this love. God Himself Like I said a few months ago, God Himself has rooted and ground you, rooted and grounded you in His unfailing, unconditional love. The fruit is full grown and and was full grown in you when you were born. It was full grown in there. You have full grown bananas, apples, peaches, pears. You have the whole the whole fruit grove on the inside of you. Somebody should have told you. But because we were told that we were separated from God, there was no nourishment of what was true of us. We were covered up with things that covered up the fruit and the reality of that awareness that we should have had. But that's changing in our moment. You were born of this love into your mother's womb. You can't get away from it. God will, like, uh, like my friend Lynn Hiles says, God is a stalker. And He's going to come. He's just going to keep coming. He's never going to stop loving you. He's going to keep coming. He's going to do everything that He can to get to you that improves your life. Yeah. He will bring people across your path <laughs> that will get you to think outside of your box. Man, that's powerful. Look at somebody and say, I was born of love. Let, let me just give you a few scriptures, and I know that I've read these before in other messages, but I, I want to read them again, and I just want you to think about it. Ecclesiastes 7.29, out of, these are all out of the New King James. Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright. God made man, this is in the Old Testament. God made man upright. You were born of love. You were born with, you are deity. You are the divine. You were born of this love. God made man upright. You know, I, uh, I heard someone say just this last week that that scripture that we've always used in 2 Corinthians 5.21 Uh, that says, Him who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That word made is an awareness word. You've always been righteous. Nobody told you. That's why Jesus came to the earth to reveal to you that you've always been righteous in God. That you were always born of the love of God. Listen to this. But they 
have sought out many schemes. We were made upright, but we've sought a lot of schemes to make everybody not upright. And I will tell you, let me look in the camera real good there. I don't usually pay any attention to it, but I'm going to look right into that camera and say this. There's a lot of money to be made if you make people unrighteous. And there's a lot of people that have made us unrighteous, and it's out of the love of money that all of those things happen. And you say, Pastor Terry, you just got in trouble. I'm already in trouble. But at this point in time, all I'm concerned about is us becoming aware of the truth, because the truth that you're aware of, if you're living in the awareness of love, it will cause your life to come into a place of freedom. Are you listening to me? Operational, functional. But they have sought out many schemes. Uh, there's one translation, or one, uh, one of the words for schemes is warlike. We've brought warlike conditions on the planet because we didn't know that we were born of love. Okay, next scripture. John 1, 9. And see, you know, Robin, I was, I, I was teaching this, this right here. I taught this. You remember in our, in our series that we used to do 30 years ago, whenever people would come into the church, and I would take new people back into the room, and I was teaching this out of, out of John 1, 9. Now, why I didn't see the rest of it, somebody say, well, thank God you saw a little. But, but here, here's the deal. I begin to see this. John 1, 9 says, That was the true light which gives light. Jesus was the true light that gives light to every man and woman coming into the world. Amen. Every, the true, that was the true light which gives light to every man. And so I would say that whenever you... I won't go into the rest of it. But I will say... What I used to say is... Whenever a child is born into the earth, they are not born spiritually dead. Amen. Why I didn't jump on the bandwagon a whole lot sooner, I do not know. But sometimes, again, the fruit of what, you've, the, the, what you possess in you can be so covered up by religion and by false teaching and things that have been dumped on you, and you, you just took it for granted that the people that were saying it knew what they were talking about. Rather than studying it out for yourself. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Everybody say, not according to our works. But according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. You, you, you know, listen. That's why I keep saying I was there with him before all of this started. You were too. You just didn't remember once you got here. Because we've been covered up with so much stuff that is opposite of the reality of who we are and what we're born out of. Listen to this. It was given before time began, but now, in that moment of time, whenever Paul was writing, but now has been revealed by the appearing of Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. There's a whole lot in there, but what I want to say is that there was an unveiling that Jesus did towards us. There's an unveiling going on in our moment today. And I know that it looks bad around us. I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to be here a while and we're going to help straighten this mess out. God is not going to straighten the mess out as I keep going in this series. God isn't going to straighten the mess out. God straightened the mess out. Before time began, He saved all of us. It was already done. It was accomplished. Jesus came to the cross to reveal it, to unveil it to the human race so that we could begin to move forward and go in a different direction. But in order to say some of these things, you've got to have a little bit of unveiling in your own mind. 
Because whenever you start down this road, everybody's going to say to you, oh, I don't think you know what you're talking about. But see, if, this, if you're living in the awareness of this love and you're experiencing this on another level, you, you can't negate from me what I'm experiencing in this moment. You can negate my words, but you cannot negate how I feel and what I'm experiencing in this moment. Romans 8, 37 and 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded, there's the key, I am persuaded, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither death nor life, neither death nor life, neither death nor life, Neither death nor life. That's why we have to come to a place in our own minds where we remove this thing called hell and eternal conscious torment because that is not the character of my Father. That has been so destructive to the entire human race and is so destructive to the entire planet. And this is why we've got going on why we've, what we've got going on right now. But I'm telling you it's going to change. Somebody told me uh, about a week and a half ago, they said, you know, I'm just out of here. This was a Christian. I'm, I'm out of here. And I said, that's fine. Leave me your keys and, and your, uh, all your uh, stuff that goes along with your finances because I'm going to stay a while. Come on. Well, I believe that the rapture is getting ready to happen. Fine. Turn all your stuff over to me. I'm going to be here for a while. Because we're setting up kingdom. And besides that, those of you that think you're leaving, you're going to be back fairly shortly anyway. With our our doctrines that we had, you come right back anyway. (laughs) That was free. Listen to this. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, this field of existence. Nothing can separate you from who He is, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That scripture in Ephesians 1.18, I don't know if you guys have got that one, but let's, let's go over to Ephesians 118, it, Paul, this is Paul's first prayer. At the, he needed to pray for you after he said, you've always been accepted, you've always been forgiven, you've always been blessed. Then he says, I pray that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That's where we're at right now in this moment. This, this season, and maybe it won't ever stop, but, uh, but in this specific season that we are in right now is a season of enlightenment. It, it, is a, it is a season of, uh, uh, of awareness that will take us deeper and be more functional in the things that we say we believe than we've ever been before. Yeah. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the, in the saints. Everybody say, in the saints. Now I'm going to bring a little different thought to that in the next week or so here. This word know is the word that means uh, an awareness of, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, that you may know, that you may have, all of these know words usually have something to do with an awareness, coming into an awareness. Everybody say awareness. awareness. Now go back over to Ephesians 3, And verse 18, Ephesians 3, and verse 18. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Everybody say that you may be able. 
This word comprehend, that you may be able to comprehend, means to take eagerly, to seize, to possess with your thinking, with your mind, to take eagerly, to seize, to possess. We read out of, out of Romans 8, to be fully persuaded. To obtain, to perceive, to be aware. That you may be able to comprehend is fully moving into what you have always possessed. Amen. Now let me, let me keep saying what I said earlier. A lot of us are waiting on God to do something. Most of the church is waiting on the rapture, the tribulation, and whatever else they think is coming. Okay? And therefore, we don't do much in our moment to possess, because the Scriptures are pretty clear that we, you've been given everything that pertains unto life and godliness. When was it given to you? Before time began. It's always been yours. But if nobody ever tells you, if you never hear a preacher, if nobody ever puts on some gospel shoes of peace, are you listening to me, and begins to preach this, then nobody will know. But if somebody starts saying it, and, and then you start believing it and getting outside of your box, and you begin to possess it, you seize it. Today, the winner of the Super Bowl will be the team that seizes the moment. Amen. What is that word on that one movie, if you seize the moment? Carpe diem. Seize the moment. You've been given everything. Well, I'm waiting on God to heal me. Then you'll just keep waiting. Because He did that before time began. It was culminated at the cross. Jesus revealed it so that you could walk in it. But it's always been yours. And we're waiting on God to touch us. Or we're waiting on some big fancy preacher to, to lay hands on us so we'll be okay. It, what I want to do is I want to show you that you're okay without me. And you say, well, Pastor Terry, nobody will come then. if they're... No, because the more you come into the heights and depths and breadths and lengths of this, you won't separate yourself from me. You'll begin to join yourself to me because I'm a part of you. I'm one with you as well as we're one with God. I'm one with you also. <laughs> fully moving into what you already possess. You already possess it because Papa God established it for you and in you. Everybody say, I'm not waiting on God. Go down to verse 19. Here in Ephesians 3. I mean, we could, I could probably take weeks going through this. Verse 19. It gives me time to breathe for a moment. <laughs> Take a breath. <laughs> I'll start reading and she'll put it up here in a second. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now let, let's look at this first word, no. It's an intimate word. It's like Adam knew his wife Eve and they had children. Terry knew his wife Robin and we had Jessica and Ashley. It's an intimate word. It's a, it's a relationship word. It's an experiential word. Are, are you listening to me? It's more than just you being aware of it. I can be aware of Robin... Whenever I'm over in Kenya or Uganda, I can be aware of her, but there's something about being next to her that we can do some other things whenever we're together. Amen. Come on. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, 
it, 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 it has levels of this. And I think that's why even here in Ephesians 3, there's heights and depths and breadths and lengths of awareness. But then whenever you move into that awareness, you move into the functionality of, of what that awareness brings. Because I don't want to just talk about it. I, want, I don't want to just, I just didn't marry Robin to talk about it. You can take that wherever you want to take it. <laughs> this is an experiential word. It's more than just being aware of it. It's to experience it in your emotions and your reactions to life. Are you listening to me? Um, I'll be careful. <laughs> I put on a little music the other night. <laughs> Come on, come on now. I set the atmosphere. I set the mood. Thank you. Come on now. I was aware of her life and her presence. Did I know that it might go into an experiential mode? My hope was there, brother. My, my, I had an earnest expectation. The creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> I better get out my chief sanky. <laughs> it's an experiential thing, guys. And so many of us have sat in our churches, sat in our Bible studies, and we have a lot of knowledge. See, look, to know the love of Christ, those heights and depths and breadths and lengths, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that's just on a page or just us talking about it. You know, uh, there, there's something that, that happens with, 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 with what is going on in that moment. It's more than an intellectual knowledge. And this says that you might be filled with the fullness of God. So let me, let me break it down like this. And then I'm going to end here in a second. I didn't get to the next one and I really wanted to. But I think this has been pretty good this morning. You're already full of God. But you need to be filled with God. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it does. You've got everything within you that, that God is. You possess Him. You possess love. You being aware of this will fill your entire being with what you're already filled with. Your thinking that you're filled will bring a filling to the point where whenever you, whenever, you get, whenever you get filled like this, next week we're going to talk about this because we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Yeah. He, can do, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But what if we're not waiting on He? What if the He is us? And I want to end with that. Why don't you stand on your feet? Everybody say, I am who God says I am. I'm one with Him. He's one with me. There is nothing that I need. There is no lack in my life. I have everything that I need to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in and through me, the days ahead for me will be about me living in the awareness of this completion and this fullness. And there are going to be things flowing out of my life like rivers of living water that will bring manifestation into every area of my life. It will affect the people around me. I will be 
in the natural, in the natural. who God says I am on the inside. Come on, can I hear a shout this morning? Hallelujah! Father, I thank you for this moment in time. I thank you, Father, that you are not, we are not waiting on you to do anything else. You are waiting on us to think and ask from this abundant place. And I thank you, Father God, that this abundance is in full-grown manifestation in us. You do not live in time, so it has always been there. It will always be there until we walk in the reality of it in our moment. Father, I'm opening my heart. I'm opening my life. I'm opening my hands to see the reality of who you are. And I want to live in the awareness of this love. And I want to experience everything that I have on the inside of me and that others have on the inside of them. And Father, I thank you that we are going to make our days like the days of heaven on earth. In this moment, in Jesus' name. And everybody that agreed said? Amen. I love you guys. Have a great day and a great week. Robin and I will see you Wednesday night.